So that should work here, or perhaps here. All right, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers. Uh, it has been a wonderful week in Israel, actually, with my group. We spent a week here, and it's terrific, the diversity of landscape and how nice the people were with us. So thanks a lot to the organizers of that particular meeting, but also for Gila for hosting us for such a nice time. So um, I guess I have to put uh, my slides on. Um, uh, so yeah, what I'm going to do today is presenting you what we've been doing in the lab for uh, say for the last few years and we are still working on that actively. And basically it relates to our favorite species, which is horses. And um, I guess it's clear from yesterday that uh, ancient DNA has experienced not less than a true revolution over the last say five years because we can now dig up full genome of a quality that revolved the quality of modern genomes from only tiny pieces of bone material or teeth or whatever. And this has been, of course, driven by the development of uh, high throughput sequencing technologies. So we know a lot now about our past as humans, but obviously I will argue here that if we want to understand the human past, that is the history of our species and our, how, how population migrated and so forth, we can't just focus on humans because we have to understand how we have also modified and interacted with our environment. And among the environment, of course, first line will be the species we have interacted with. So should it be the mammoth, for example, where we promoted the extinction of some of the, of the, of the species? But another good candidate will be to focus on the domesticates because simply we have transformed them from wild animals into, uh, into domesticated animals. And I will argue here, even though the range of animal domesticates is pretty large, that the best that we think we should study, all of us, uh, are the horses for very good reasons. Uh, because I think that this is the animals that got perhaps the most uh, important impact on human societies and history. Uh, simply because think about transportation. When we invented chariots or when we started riding uh, horses, uh, it has totally changed the way people communicate. Actually, transportation has helped and tremendously improved the communication between people. So the exchange of religion, for example, languages, people, goods, and so forth. But also horses have been a prom prominent for warfare. And actually, many empires from the past and from antiquity to history times have been uh, conquered by hor on the horseback. Uh, also, horses have been really key to uh, agricultural, agricultural innovations. So clearly, that species has, has a lot to tell us about how our ancient societies were transformed and became what we know of today as the modern societies. But of course, domestication as a whole is interesting for another reason, because the transformation of wild animals into domesticated animals is a textbook example of uh, evolution in action. Uh, and as such, studying evolution through ancient DNA, for example, is a sort of test case and gives us a sort of better opportunity to understand how evolution actually works. Um, so generally, people interested in domestication questions, what they do is that they use comparative genomic approaches and say they will sequence uh, wild and domesticated animals and just do comparative genomics to kind of tease out the genes and the places in the genomes where those are different. And that will give you a list of candidates for the genes that uh, underlies uh, domestication. So for example, in pigs, you will sequence the wild boar, compare that to a, a bunch of pigs, likewise for the wolf and the dogs, and for maybe for plants even, between the teosinte, for example, and the maize. So for horses, actually, we could pretty much do that because uh, it exists uh, a wide population of horses that still survives until now, which is called the Shavolsky horses. So those guys actually originated from the Eurasian steppes. But uh, during the 19th century, after they have been discovered by the Western world, they almost become extinct. And actually, back in 1970, there were only a few less than uh, 50 individuals surviving. Uh, and now the population is growing up again with census sizes around 2,000s of animals, simply because of massive conservation efforts, mostly promoted in zoos and through reintroduction uh, uh, programs in the wild. So perhaps the easiest thing when you work with horse will be to think, let's do what the others do with the pigs and the boars, with the dogs and the, and the wolves, and simply try to do comparative genomics of the only wild representative of horses living today, 
to, uh, to the domesticate. So, but actually, I'm going to show you in a few slides here that that approach actually is not possible for horses, mainly because, as I said, like a couple of uh, seconds ago, that that population experienced a tremendous bottleneck that eroded most of the diversity uh, of wild animals. So clearly what we've done, and that's the, worst, uh, the work led by Cleo de Sarkisian that you've heard yesterday in the lab, what we've done was to sequence a bunch of modern genome of Shabolsky horses throughout the whole captive pedigree. So basically we have high quality genomes above 20x coverage of the descent of the main funders of the whole captive pedigree. So that we can actually through them recap the whole genomic diversity present in that gene pool. But on top of that, we also use ancient DNA to go back to the 19th century and early 20th century to kind of see how that diversity was in the past before we started the captive pool. All right, so what we find you exploiting those genomes is, for example, using heterozygosity estimates where we uh, chunk the genome into 50 kb windows and estimate through the feta where the sun estimate the heterozygosity as the average we see genome-wide. Uh, we see that the ancient animals that you see here in green will be the Shabowski horses and in red that will be the domesticated horses. You see that the past animals, so those from the 19th century here, actually were more heterozygous than the ones that are surviving in the, in the genetic pool of the, uh, of the captive animals, which actually is the, 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 the confirmation of the tremendous uh, gene... Uh, um, uh, bottleneck that that uh, population has experienced. So first ID, that population, even in the 19th century, was globally way more diverse than it is today. So if you want to compare that to domesticate with the wild animals that survive today, maybe there's not enough diversity to recap the whole diversity that segregated once in that population. All right, so we do the same now with the same genomes. And what we do here, don't focus on the first uh, uh, half or top half of the of the graph, but those bars reflect the level of inbreeding that we see in the genome, and uh, we do that using different approaches, but the, the larger the bar, the higher the, di the, the, the inbreeding. So here you go, the inbreeding within the 19th century samples, as opposed to the inbreeding levels that you see now in Shavalsky horses living today, or domesticated animals, so you see that those uh, that lived in the 19th century had quite some inbreeding level, uh, but actually it could be much more important now in the captive pool, simply because a captive pool, you don't have many opportunity to mate the horses in any, in any random mating process. So by simply the captive pool do not really reflect or actually as an increased level of inbreeding uh, uh, today. And actually, that level could be as high as the inbreeding level that we see in the domestic world. So clearly, that population, loss of diversity, quite inbred, not so good candidates to compare them against the domestics, right? So the last thing we've done with the Shavalsky was to investigate gene flow with domestic horses. And simply what we did back in 2013, when we characterized the first Shavalsky horse genome, and we compared the, the genome against uh, diverse, uh, di uh, a bunch of genomes of domesticated horses using these statistics, where A is the ancestral allele, B is a derived allele on a four-way genome alignment with four different horse genomes. What we found was in that topology, we don't have any significant deviation of BABA over BABA patterns, suggesting that Shavalsky horses are equidistant to pretty much any domestic breed. But now that we have sequenced the diversity of those guys, the Shavalsky horses, we can do the reverse test, namely where we took as H3 in that position of the tree, the domesticated horses, and compare them to couple of, of Shavalsky horses with all the possible permutation. And strikingly for us, what we found when we did that was an excess of BABA patterns over ba or ABBA patterns suggesting a gene flow event between some of the Shavalsky horses living today and some of the domesticated horses. I can plot it in a different way. We're also in a D-statistics test where the outgroup is the donkey, when the H3 is the domestic horses, and when the H1 and H2 are either the Shavalskys from the 19th century or the Shavalsky from the 20th century, what we find in red is all the details that are significant and uh, well above the significance level, you see that there is a bunch of Shavalsky horse genomes that show admixture significant with a bunch of diverse domestic horses. So clearly in the current population of Shavalsky horses, it exists some horses that have a significant influx of domestic horse genes. 
Bottom line of the story, well, we can't really do the comparative genomics between wild animals, as described by the Shabalski horses, and the modern domesticates. So we thought, well, if the wild horses that survive until now, today, are not good enough, then the only way for us will be to take ancient DNA to go back in time when horses were wild, actually. So we go back in time prior to the domestication process and try to do the comparison in a temporal con uh, co um, uh, context. Um, and this has been done, we were not the first, obviously, to do that. This has been done, for example, in a very famous paper by Arno Ludwig Schlapp back uh, in 2009, where they uh, uh, use ancient DNA techniques to characterize and genotype the, gen the diversity at a series of genes involved in cut color. And they have seen that during the transition from the Copper Age to the Bronze Age, which is coincident with the beginning of horse domestication, somewhere around 5,500 years ago, they described the, an explosion of allelic diversity at some of those genes, suggesting that this was about the time when humans started playing with the genes of horses and selected here and there different alleles depending on the colors they preferred the most. But really, the genes they had is not a lot of information, really. They had the equivalent of not even a fifth of a single book compared to the amount of books or volumes present in the whole Wikipedia encyclopedia, right? So clearly, by that work, it showed the way, but I mean, there's a lot we will miss by simply focusing on those genes, obviously. So what we thought instead was to use whole genome sequencing. And rather than just focus on gene candidates, because we could miss the, r the right candidates, actually, we would sequence the whole genome of horses that were living prior to the domestication times and then do the comparison of their genome to a diversity of domestic genomes that are living today. And potentially, that comparison will tease out a lot of what made us able to domesticate that species. All right, so this was, uh, has been uh, uh, led by two very talented PhD students in my life, Michael Schuber and uh, Akon Janssen, who are sitting in the, in the audience. So what we did was, let's take a mare and a stallion. So the stallion was 16,000 of years old, the mare was 43,000 of years old, and the samples came from the Taimir Peninsula in north-central Siberia. We took those dates, even if they pre predate the horse domestication si quite significantly, 5,500 years ago, simply because the, the early times of domestication for horses are still debated. And we wanted to be sure that those horses were wild animals and that there's no possibility at all that they will be converted back into a domesticated horse according to an unanticipated archaeological discovery. So what we did was, you know, regular throughput sequencing approaches. And we managed to characterize that genome at about 24x coverage, the other one around 8x coverage. So the first thing we've done is studying the phylogenetic relationship of those horses to the diversity that we know today within the horses. And we found that those two specimens were actually outside of the diversity that exists today, should it be represented by the Shavalsky horse genomes or from a diversity of domesticated genomes. So that tree has been generated by a uh, um, super, matri uh, super matrix alignment of all the genes present in the exons where we use uh, different models for um, substitution models for the first and second and third uh, position of the genes. I should say that we will have the same tree topology should we use the SNPs and plug them in trimix actually. So it looks like our ancient horses I go back maybe to that one, they are an outlier of the present diversity and all behaves as if you have a third population leading to our ancient horse genomes and the second population represented by the domesticated horses versus a third represented by the Shavarsky horses. And since we are evolutionary genomicists, what we like a lot when we see those models is to try to put numbers in the time of split in the, in the, in the changes of population size. So for example, for timing the split of the different population, we did that by different approaches. One is simulating under an isolation model of where, for example, you have an ancient population on one hand and the modern population, either Shavarsky horses or domesticated horses, where we have a demographic model plugged in the simulation and we just use an ABC, an approximate Bayesian computation approach based on the F statistic that has been described by the people, by Green and colleagues back in 2010, where really we focus on the heterozygous sites on the modern horse genomes and we ask how often we are sampling the derived 
allele in the ancient genome. And that as such has a lot of information as for the population time speed. So we were able, for the three different populations we are interested in, to, sub so to, to find the time when those split. Another approach that we now have used in a following up study is to just use PSMC profiles that describe the amount of the effective size of the population over the last two millions of years. And in green, you see the population of Shavalsky horse. In red, you see the population of domesticated horses. And in blue, our ancient population that is outside of the range of diversity of horses living today, you see that those diverge at about that time, which, is, which tells you that around 150 thousands of years, those population splits. That's, by the way, quite convenient, because this is exactly the right estimate we got with the other approach, so everything matches pretty quickly. So we have a first split event uh, in the horse recent evolutionary history, somewhere around 150 thousands of years ago. That creates the population that will become the population we have sampled, that of the ancient horses, on one hand. And on the other hand, a population that will later split around 40 thousands of years ago, pre-LGM, pre the last glacial maximum, into, on one hand, something that will become the domesticated horse, and on the other hand, something that will become what we call today the Shavalsky horses. So when we have seen, seen that, to be very honest, we were really disappointed because, I mean, what we used as an outgroup of the domestication event was even more distant than the Shavalsky horses that are living today. Actually, we would have been better off with the Shavalsky should they not be so much admixed in bread and eroded in their diversity. But the story became quite interesting for us when we did apply the de-statistics tests again on that data set, where we put it this time as H3, the uh, ancient horses, and that H2 and H1, respectively, the Shavalsky horses, representing one of the two descending population, and the domestic horses representing the uh, second uh, po the descending population. Well, what we find very significantly is evidence for excess of BABA pattern, where domestic horses, regardless of the breed we consider, share more derived alleles with the ancient horses we have. So that single fact tells you something, which is either there has been a population model like that, where the ancient population originate geographically uh, from a geographically structured population that is more related to the domestic horses than it is to the Shavarsky horses. That's one possible model. So clearly, there's an ancestry that is shared between the, the ancient population and the domesticated population, population model one. or the second possibility is that there has simply been some gene flow from the descendant of that population that is now extinct that brought some genes into the domesticated lineage specifically. So if that model is true, then what we can do is try to estimate the level of gene flow we see simply by using a ratio of ABBA patterns, so a ratio of the F4 statistics actually. So you, you have told you that we have an excess of those patterns between the ancient horses and the domesticated horses that share more derived alleles than to the other one. So if we want to normalize that somehow to the maximum level of inbreeding, the simple thing we have to do is to switch that one with a domestic horse, because the domestic horse, they are fully admixed with the other domesticated breeds, right? So we just simply normalize those patterns over those patterns, and that gives you a number which is a minimum of 15 persons, suggesting that there is at least, assuming that the population model uh, with admixture is the right one, that there is at least 15 percent of the genome of the domesticated horses that originally from that extinct population that we have just discovered in the Tinya Peninsula. So the next thing, that was for the population model underlying domestication, but the next thing we've done, and that actually the reason why we did that story, that study, is that we wanted to uh, narrow down the genes that underlie domestication. So for that, we developed a battery of uh, selection scans uh, uh, for trying to identify the genes that have segregated faster uh, that they should under a neutral model. So for that, for example, we use DNDS ratios of the clade of domestic horses in red versus the ancient horses that are wild and, and uh, sought for uh, uh, genes that show a DNDS ratio over one significantly. For example, we also look at genomic blocks of, I believe, 50 KB windows or 200, I don't remember, precisely where what we looked for is in blue regions where the ancient horses prior to domestication show the higher genetic diversity as represented, for example, by Fita Watterson estimates over the diversity that we see today in domesticated horses because that will be the signature of the sweep. And also we constrained that to match also regions where that block uh, 
was also showing deviation to neutrality as represented, for example, in red by really low Tajima Ds, for example. So just two of four different possible tests that we decided to trust only if two of those were matching the same genes. And the story was kind of compelling when we did that because we found about 125 genes that show signature that we kind of interpret as adaptive in, in, that, in that system and that we could break down in four big functional uh, classes. The first functional class that we found are genes that I do call involved in locomotion. By that I mean that those genes are associated with myopathies in human mice and other models, balance problems, model coordination uh, disorders, problems in the myotendons and also the articular junctions. And actually if you see that it kind of makes sense given that we have domesticated at least we know that for horses so that we can ride them. So finding genes whose function is related to domestication is kind of relieving. Uh, but also what we find, which is also fairly consistent, is that a bunch of genes related to cardiovascular changes and, uh, for example, genes involved in the regulation of blood pressure. And if you, at the end of the day, if you domesticate sort of horses to ride them, uh, you can't just have big muscles and like right articular junctions or stuff. You need still to get the cardiovascular system that will throw in the system enough oxygen so that the, the, the horse can uh, keep on running, right? So those classes, we love them because they intuitively made a lot of sense. The third class was represented by genes involved in the shape of the face and in the size of the, of the, of the limbs, which also makes a lot of sense given what we need, what we know from the domestication in horses that has involved change in the shape, uh, in the, in the, in the shape of the face and also of the size of the limb. And the last class that we found was actually, in my opinion, the most interesting because we spotted a series of genes involved in cognition or uh, behavior, for example, involved in the fear response or in the learning ability and what if an animal, uh, what um, the uh, domesticated horses or any domesticated animal, you need to be able to train them, right? You need to be able to have to, to interact with them socially. So maybe those genes represent perhaps just a subset, but at least that's a place to start to better understand the genetic makeup of, of domesticated horses. And actually, uh, Christina Gamba, postdoc in my lab, and Charlene uh, Gaunitz in my labs, they are actually doing the same kind of comparisons where we compared ancient genomes to modern day genomes, but by time slicing the past and try to find in which culture those sweeps have actually occurred. Maybe it's in Roman times, maybe it's in Scythian times, who knows? I hope that we will be able to know that fairly soon. So the third best thing that we did when we compared those genomes were was not to be interested only in positive selection, but to playing with purifying selection pattern. And there was a good reason for that in our, in our opinion, is that it's well known from, uh, from population genetics that the larger a population, the, uh, fa the, the, the easier it is for selection to filter out nasty mutation that I will call deleterious mutation here in red from the gene pool. Because large populations, there's not so much place for drift, so selection can play a big role. Imagine a domestication context, which happens necessarily in small population because you can't domesticate the whole planet at once. Then that reduction in population size will make those nasty mutation to survive perhaps longer in the population. So you will perhaps expect a cost of domestication, as we've called it, that is that namely the genomes of the domesticated horses or animals in general will show a higher frequency, an accumulation of deleterious mutation. So we wanted to test that simply by comparing the genomes prior to their domestication and the genome of their descent, namely the diversity of domesticated horses. But we needed a way to quantify a purifying selection, and for that we relied on GURB scores, we are s which are simply scores that are built on whole genome alignments of every mammal that has been sequenced today. And you see, regardless of those names that you can't read, it's like a diversity of different species, the camel here, the chimp somewhere, somewhere and so forth. They are sites that never vary at the scale of the full mammals, right? So you could intuitively imagine that those sites, they are very constrained. And if a mutation goes there, it will, it will be very, uh, very rapidly filtered from the population. So perhaps those sites, they will present something that is very deleterious if mutated. So you could like rank those sites as likely candidates for highly deleterious mutation. But the sites that are very diverse at the scale of the whole mammals, then 
they tolerate a lot of mutation, so perhaps they will present less of deleterious mutation. So you use those sites and you simply sum them up at the scale of the whole genome, uh, focusing on homozygous sites not to be confounded by inbreeding differences between the, the sites and what, uh, between the animals. And what you see is that the ancient horse genome actually have a genetic load to an accumulation of deleterious mutation, which is significantly inferior from most of the diversity of the domestic genomes that we see, confirming that domestication in horses at least, came with a, a negative effect, which is the accumulation in the genome of, of deleterious mutation. So as a follow-up study now, uh, Clio, Lucas Arkisian, uh, Pablo Librado, and Luca Armini in my lab, now he's leaving my lab, but he used to be in my lab for the last two or three years, have been focusing on a new population of horses, which is Yakutian horses. So Yakutia, you have a polar view here, it's Eurasia, you will have uh, North America here, uh, 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 Yakutia is here, and we focused on that region simply because horses are living in that region, so that's a good argument for us, but clearly that region is the coldest country in the whole northern hemisphere. By that I mean that the horses, they live outside free range, even if they are domesticated, but they survive temperatures as low as minus 70 degrees Celsius in the winter. So we simply wanted to use comparative genomics to tease out the genes underlying their striking adaptation to the cold. So what we've done really rapidly is sequencing now a whole bunch of modern genomes at above 20x coverage for different domestic breeds, but we also sequence uh, 12, I believe it was, yeah, 12 or something like that, uh, genomes of living Yakutian horses at uh, above 10 to 20 X coverage, uh, but we also sequence with ancient DNA approaches a genome of a Yakutian horse that was living four thousands of years ago at about 18 X coverage, and another one that was living in the 19th century. And we simply use comparative genomics and population genetics approaches to try to tell something about the adaptation of that population. Long story short, what we find is that was really a surprise for us that the 4,000-year-old horse that was living in Yakutia is actually part of the population of ancient horses that we discovered in the previous study. So this guy that was living in Yakutia is very well related in ancestry with the guys that were living in Taimir Peninsula, first thing. But what it makes it very interesting in our mind is that actually the ones that were living in the 19th century and all the ones that are living today are actually clustering within the monophyletic clade within the diversity in red of domestic horses, suggesting that perhaps there's been a population replacement in that population and that the horses that are living today in the, in the region are not in uh, genetic continuity with the horses that were or that used to be living in that region. And actually, third point of that, of that slide is that the diversity of the domestic horses most likely originate from a thunder event because it's like monophyletic that is uh, the consequence of the humans bringing horses when they rediscovered the regions somewhere around the 13th century. So what we wanted to do now is testing whether or not there was genetic con uh, continuity here. You could still be part of another population but still admix with another population. So we used again the Ababa test or the D statistic test to test whether or not the ancient Yakutian horses uh, shared an excess of diversity with the contemporary Yakutian horses, and long story short, the only test that is significant is clearly when we put as age free the 19th century horses, but not the 4,000 year old horses or the horses that we had characterizing the Taimir Peninsula, suggesting that there is a true genetic discontinuity between those populations because those guys, they don't share an excess of derived polymorphisms with the current day diversity of Shavarsky horses. Finally, what we were interested in is trying to tease out the genes underlying their adaptation to the cold. Uh, so what we've been doing is, of course, FST scans where we were interested in all outlier genes represented here in red dots. And if you do functional cl clustering of the genes that explain the most of the genetic diversity between the domestic on one hand and the Yakutian horses on one hand, you find a series of really interesting genes involved in the way you store fat, in the way you uh, reactive the, 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 the metabolism, and also in the way you regulate the development of the size of the limbs which makes in the Yakutian horses a lot of the sense because they have they are short limbs uh, actually as horses. The last thing we've done, and this is actually my favorite here, what we've done is like trying to break down where these mutations that might be adaptative were located in the genome. So for that, we looked at genes at the translation start site and also at 1 KB windows in the 10 KBs upstream of the translation start site. And really, we wanted to see whether the mutations that are potentially adaptive 
segregated more here or in any of those boxes because if that will be here that will tell you that most of the adaptation is regulatory in that population if that was on the contrary in the CDS in the coding sequences that will tell you that it was mainly through positive selection within the allelic diversity so clearly we use the fourfold sites as a sort of proxy for uh, a neutral, uh, neutral evolution, so things that are not selected, and we really compare the amount of those mutation with a high diverse uh, differentiation index in that class versus all the other class. And I'm not sure you can really see it, but there is an accumulation of outliers, mostly within those boxes. And if you quantify that more precisely, if it works, so, uh, you see that the class of the one KB the most proximal to the translations, uh, the translation start site is uh, overall presented in the adaptive mutation. So it, to summarize that, it looks like that class is enriched in adaptive mutation over the CDS uh, cod coding mut uh, mutations or in the classes that are located further up uh, stream of the gene. Uh, one example, and I will just simply stop there because it's now the time. Uh, one example is represented by the latex gene here that you see from the FST differentiation indexes, which is a gene involved in sensing extreme temperatures. So if anything, it's not really surprising where you see really a, a site here, a SNP, that is really explaining a lot of the diversity and it is located within the first KB upstream of the uh, coding sequence for that gene. We have other candidates such as adre adre adrenal receptors that are involved in the regulation of stress as a whole, uh, which makes also a lot of sense for coping with the extreme condition of the environment. All right, so just to summarize what I've said to you, uh, we find from our work that Shabalski horses are clearly not the domesticated ancestors. Uh, uh, there has been a significant contribution in the domestication process from an extinct population of horses that at least range from Taimia Peninsula to Yakutia, so in the whole, whole Arctic range in the old world. We found at least 125 genes involved in taming and domesticating horses. And for, as for Yakutian horses, we found that they represent the descent of a founder event, not in continuity with the, previous, the horses that were living in the place previously. And mostly, uh, the changes that explain most of the genetic differentiation from other domestics are regulatory. So with that, uh, I will be happy to take questions. And I should thank, of course, the great core of collaborators that have helped us a lot through all those studies. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. So now we have time for uh, one question. Yeah. So, um, is there actually convergent evolution? You showed the Yakutian horses, and you showed the ones from the kind of later time periods, and the one that is 4,000 years old. Do you find anything in the 4,000 year old one that could show adaptation to this cold environment that probably has to live there? That's a very good suggestion. I, I, I didn't get the idea, so we haven't looked. Uh, uh, clearly, we should definitely contrast the adaptation signal versus that one as an outlier or the ones from Taimia Peninsula. It would make a lot of sense, actually, given that they are even more recent in time, so the fixation of most of the sites should have occurred already. We will do it. Thanks for the suggestion. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Right. So I will, the short answer is no, uh, but I will not be able to do that test with dogs because I don't have access to data that will, that will help me doing the contrast. But we have access in geogenetics, and actually Rasmus sitting in that room has, 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 has led a very interesting study on, on, on polar bears also. So of course we will contrast our list with the list of candidates that each is out from the polar bear. We have also access to a series of genomic scans that exist in humans for a population living really high up north. And we simply don't have, we haven't done that test yet, but this is really lined up. Of course we want to see if, if, if at all it's the same kind of mechanisms that are recruited when living in such uh, extreme environments.
Right, so donkey is a very interesting thing to study also. As a matter of fact, uh, should the funding uh, come in the lab, we will be doing that. The idea will be to compare what we find in horses versus the donkeys, simply for one good reason, in my opinion, is that the domestication, as far as we know now, is pretty much contemporary. It's 5,500 years old in both models, except that in the, in the donkey, it's in Egypt at the very least. I mean, there is open debate if whether or not it has occurred elsewhere. But for the donkey, they have not been domesticated for anything but carrying loads. So they were draft animals. So they are sister species. So this is a unique opportunity, I believe, in mammals to get sister species domesticated independently for very different things. And so you could contrast what is it that we were seeking for by just domesticating them. As a matter of fact, we have already sequenced um, uh, 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 so donkey, sorry, at the genomic scale, there's nothing, as far as I know. There's clearly nothing. A few uh, her, uh, donkeys have been genotyped for 50k SNPs, but there is one genome available that we de novo assembled back in 2013. Now we are re-preparing a new reference genome for donkey, so, but the reference genome doesn't really exist in a high-quality genome. And uh, we have sequenced, or resequenced, I should say, the, the genome of a Somali wild ass. It's a paper led by Akon here, sitting like two, two seats uh, to your right. Uh, and where he discovered that actually Somali wild ass were pretty admixed with the grave eye zebras that used to be living in the same uh, geographic range. So this situation will be pretty much similar to Shovalsky versus domestic. It will be not a straightforward way thing because we will have to tease out the blocks of the genomes that are actually the descent of those gene flow events, right? But uh, We'll be working on that. Yeah, uh, in, in comparison to dogs, uh, did you try to compare these uh, genes involved in domestication in horses, especially the subset that is uh, related to cognition and behavior no. with those that went through adaptive evolution in so dogs? So they were a few hits, but really, to be fairly honest, really scanning tables, right? Really, so not doing particular enrichment and statistically tested. There were a couple for the dogs that were there. I remember something involving the circadian, circadian clock, for example. But more than anything else in cattle, if not dog, actually a couple of the genes that we see in size shifts, involving size shift, have been also described in cattle. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you.